It is good to be with you again tonight. I hope you're all doing well. If you have any updates to the prayer concerns, I hope you'll let me know. We do have some news in the congregation. We have some friends and family and loved ones who are not doing very well. And we also have some who've lost some loved ones because of the COVID epidemic and also just because of illness and age in general, various diseases. So we have a lot going on as a congregation. We'll try to get an email out in the near future here, if not uh, later today or before class, hopefully. But uh, anyway, a lot to remember in our prayers. Let's be praying for each other and also praying for uh, those in positions of authority, obviously, as we always do. But uh, if you have anything in particular, anything special we need to be praying about, let me know. Uh, send me an email or give me a call at 608-224-0274. I'd love to hear from you. And please also remember that we are looking forward to being together this coming Lord's Day morning at 9 o'clock, 9 a.m. And we'll join together for worship there at 9 a.m. We have a limit of 25, which we have not been too close to. I think we had 19 this past week, so we're getting there. And we'll see when we need to add that second service back for now. We're doing the best that we can just to be there at 9 o'clock, and then if we have overflow, if we have more than 25, we'll also meet at 1030, but that'll be a replay on the projector of the 9 o'clock service. But feel free to join us at 9 o'clock this Sunday. Make sure to join up or sign up on the Sign Up Genius account. That really helps, so we kind of know where we are. Uh, we had five or six visitors this past Lord's Day, so signing up, if we sign up as members of the congregation, if we sign up ahead of time, it lets us know kind of where we are with those numbers. If you need any help with that, get in touch with either me or Kenna, and we'd be glad to help you through that process. But again, anything we need to add to the bulletin, let me know, and I'd be glad to do the best that I can. Uh, I have good news tonight. Uh, it may seem like a minor thing to some people. It's something that has uh, irritated me for a while. For years, I've been dealing with the cursor on my MacBook jumping around randomly when I type. And I, I knew there was a fix out there somewhere. I fixed it on my old one, never got around to fixing it on my new MacBook. And I'll be typing and suddenly a paragraph will disappear or the cursor will jump to a previous paragraph and I'll start typing right in the middle of it. And it was just driving me mad and just had a hard time with that, but never had the time to look into it. And finally, I talked with my son last night and uh, looked it up online and dug into it a little bit and I found there is a box to uncheck on a little menu deep in there concerning the trackpad and that might have solved the problem. So I did not have that problem as we were getting ready or as I was getting ready for tonight's class. So that's my good news for the night. I am thankful for that. And I don't know if you can see the woodpile behind me and the status. <laughs> it is now down just to... Um, one layer and then kind of one fourth of the layer in front. I think just on one side of me here, you might be able to see some wood from that second layer. So winter continues in Wisconsin and I am thankful for a warm place to live. And I'm thankful to God for providing that home for us and for the warmth that we've enjoyed. Tonight, we get back to our study of the book of Luke. And by way of review, in case you might be joining us for the first time, we know that Luke is a Gentile. He's a medical doctor. He writes both Luke and Acts to a man by the name of Theophilus. He's known for writing in chronological order. He includes a lot of groups of people who are often overlooked or abused in the ancient world. So that's just Luke in a nutshell. If we were trying to explain this book to somebody who didn't know anything about the book of Luke, he records the Lord's life and... It is a well-researched account, and he does a great job with the chronology of it. That's kind of what Luke is known for. And once again, the harmony of the Gospels will be very helpful tonight. If you have that, it'd be good to have it out. We have a lot of extra information in the other three accounts that's not found in Luke that will help us to understand a few things tonight. It's available on Amazon for about 25 bucks. I know we only have a few weeks probably left in our class but it is a valuable tool. If I were stranded on a desert island, I've said before, I would want a copy of the Bible. I'd want a concordance, maybe a Bible dictionary or encyclopedia. Uh, but if I could, I, I would really want a harmony of the Gospels. The Gospel accounts are so important to us. And it's important that we study those and kind of figure out where things fit in. Uh, over the past several weeks, we have been in the last week of the Lord's life. And uh, last week, we picked up with Jesus leaving the Last Supper, as it is sometimes called. He establishes the Lord's Supper, and then he leaves, and he uh, heads across the Kidron Valley to the Mount of Olives, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he prays for most of that night. He doesn't sleep that night, as I understand it, but he prays all night long before he is betrayed by Judas, uh, one of the 12 apostles. This happens in the wee hours Friday morning. 
And then we have basically three phases of the Jewish trial. We started with Annas at his home in the home of uh, Annas, the former high priest, at the home of Caiaphas is where we go next. Caiaphas is the current high priest appointed by Rome, kind of illegally according to Jewish law. So Annas was considered to be the legitimate high priest. But they go from Annas to Caiaphas, and then they have basically a just brief summary of everything they've already decided beforehand when they get the entire Sanhedrin together very, very early, right as the sun comes up on Friday morning. So they're just checking the boxes. The decision has already been made uh, at these previous two meetings. They're just running it by everybody and making sure they're all on the same page there, that they want to kill the Lord, and this is how they're going to do it. And all of this is happening, or as this is happening, Peter denies Jesus three times out in the courtyard uh, as these things are being discussed inside. And, and this is just as Jesus had predicted. And so it is confirmed by the crowing of the rooster, at which point Peter goes out and he weeps bitterly. And also as this is happening, we remember at the end of our class last week, we studied Judas. A little follow-up to what happens with him. He feels remorse. And he tries to return the 30 pieces of silver, and Judas then goes out and he hangs himself. And I would also point out that Jesus is physically beaten a few times throughout the Jewish portion of the trial. It's very easy to overlook that, but he is, in fact, hit a number of times in the middle of the night there. And so the physical part of this, in addition to the, the mental and the spiritual strain, the physical part of this has already started as well. So that's where we left off last week. At this point, we move on from the Jewish part of the trial to the Roman part of this. So let's look at what happens next. And tonight we pick up with Luke chapter 23. And we'll be looking at verses 1 through 5. Luke chapter 23, verses 1 through 5. Then the whole body of them got up and brought him before Pilate. And they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar, and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. So Pilate asked him, saying, Are you the king of the Jews? And he answered him and said, It is as you say. Then Pilate said to the chief priests and the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they kept on insisting, saying, He stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even as far as this place. Well, there are a number of things for us to notice in this little paragraph here. First of all, I find it interesting that these five verses are spread over four pages in the harmony of the Gospels. In other words, we have quite a bit more information in the other accounts than what we have here in the book of Luke. But we start with the Jews after their three-phase trial, uh, bringing Jesus to Pilate. That's where this little paragraph here begins. They're handing it over or bringing Jesus before Pilate. Uh, Matthew says that they bound Jesus and uh, they identify Pilate as the governor. Uh, Mark says that they led him away and delivered him up to Pilate. So they're turning him over. They're transferring this prisoner from their custody to the custody of the Roman government. Uh, John says that they took Jesus to the praetorium which is just basically a fancy word for the governor's official residence. I know we have the governor's mansion here in Madison. Well, not Madison technically, I guess, Maple Bluff or whatever. But we have the governor's mansion here locally. So that's kind of what that was. They took Jesus to the praetorium, which was the governor's official refer uh, residence. Uh, John also adds that the Jews themselves did not actually enter into the praetorium. <laughs> they wouldn't go through the front door. Uh, they stayed on the outside, and the reason is so that they would not uh, be defiled, so that they would not become ceremonially unclean and therefore not be able to eat the Passover. And so almost like them not accepting the 30 pieces of silver uh, back from Judas because it was blood money, even though they were the ones who gave him the blood money, uh, so also they are not going into the governor's mansion so as not to be near any Gentiles, so as not to defile themselves. Uh, making themselves ceremonially, ceremonially unclean and unable to eat the Passover. So here they're in the process of trying to murder the Son of God, and they're concerned about not being uh, unclean before the Passover. And so they're, this is what they're concerned about. So they're wrongly convicting and sending a fellow Jew into the governor's mansion while they themselves stay on the outside because they don't want to be unclean. Um, in John, Pilate, once Jesus shows up, Pilate wants to know, what accusation do you bring against this man? Uh, back in Luke, in verse 2, they just jump right into it. 
uh, in John, Pilate has to ask. If you remember from last week, uh, their main issue was that Jesus claimed to be God, that he's blaspheming. Uh, but here, it's interesting to me, they don't really talk about blasphemy because Pilate wouldn't care about that. That's not his deal. And so here, the charge is different, isn't it? And uh, here, uh, they only give the charge that Pilate would care about. And so they accuse Jesus of misleading our nation. And so the idea of maybe wreaking havoc and, and making things difficult. And then secondly, forbidding the paying of taxes to Caesar. And then thirdly, saying that he himself is a king. And, and this case is custom made, isn't it? To try to get uh, Pilate forced to do something about it. In John, by the way, uh, when Pilate asks what charges they bring against this man, they say, if this man were not an evildoer, we would not have delivered him up to you. <laughs> In other words, just trust us. You know, we wouldn't have arrested him if he wasn't worthy of death and, and that kind of thing. This man just needs to disappear. And so Pilate then basically says, well, then you handle this. This is not an issue for me. This is something you need to deal with. Judge him according to your own law. Just kind of paraphrasing there. And they respond, we are not allowed to put anyone to death. And so at this point, Pilate then understands uh, that the Jews are looking for the death penalty in this case. And uh, John points out that this is the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, this asking for the death penalty, something they couldn't do themselves, but something that Rome had to do. If you remember, uh, how did the Jews carry out capital punishment? Well, their method was stoning. So they threw stones at somebody until they were dead. But uh, Jesus had referred to himself as being lifted up, if you remember that, a couple times. Uh, there are prophecies about Jesus being pierced and so on. Those are things that did not happen with a stoning. And so this needs to be a crucifixion. And if the Jews had done it on their own, it would have been a stoning. And so all of this, including coming to Pilate, is therefore the fulfillment of prophecy. Uh, in John, Pilate then goes back into the praetorium, and so it seems, looking at what's going on here, that he's going in and out. So he's going from his chamber, the courtroom or whatever, and then out on the porch of some kind or a patio to talk to the Jews, and then back inside, because remember, they won't come in. And he doesn't want to do all his work out there in the cold. And uh, so Pilate turns back to Jesus once he has him back inside, and he wants to know, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus responds, it is as you say. And I do find it interesting that the king accusation seems to be the only one of the three that Pilate is really concerned about. That is the most serious of the charges. Uh, even with the taxes, that really wasn't something um, nobody likes paying taxes, I think we might say, especially back then. But uh, uh, this one about him being the king is the one that Pilate is pretty concerned about. In John, instead of answering Pilate directly on the king question, uh, Jesus, as he often does, answers the question with a question. And he puts it right back on Pilate. And he says to Pilate, Are you saying this on your own initiative, or did others tell you about me? And I think most of us have perhaps been in a similar situation. Somebody comes to us with an accusation, and sometimes it really matters where it's coming from, doesn't it? Well, who said that? Who told you to say that? Who is accusing me of this particular thing? And so Jesus, as I understand it here, is basically asking, are you really concerned about me being a king? Or are these people pressuring you to be concerned about me being a king? And I, I kind of think it's interesting. I, we know the answer, don't we? Without the Jews pressing this issue, Pilate and Jesus might not have ever met. They might not have ever have crossed paths. Uh, at this point in John, Pilate answers Jesus' question to his original question with another question. <laughs> I am not a Jew, am I? And then he says, your own nation and the chief priest delivered you up to me. What have you done? In other words, why does any of this matter? Why are you here? Put this in your own words. Why are you here in front of me early this morning? And at this point, Jesus explains that his kingdom is not of this world. If it were of this world his servants would be fighting, that he would not be delivered over to the Jews. But uh, as it is, his kingdom is not of this world. This is a spiritual kingdom, not an earthly kingdom. Now, if you remember in last week's class, Jesus' servants were fighting, weren't they? Um, he, in fact, told them to get a sword the week before that, or really just really the night before this in our time sequence here in the, uh, in the chronology. 
And of course they had two swords, and now if you remember, Peter is the guy who whacks the servant's ear off and all that. Well, I kind of would ask here, why doesn't that get called up as evidence if somebody was here? Well, first of all, the Jews weren't actually in the room at this point, as far as we know, as far as we're told. But then also, even if they had been, or even if somebody had been there, these Roman soldiers who went and helped with the arrest, there was no evidence of this taking place. Remember, Jesus put the servant's ear back on and miraculously healed the man. And so there is no evidence of any fighting on Jesus' part. Uh, but in truth, uh, Jesus' disciples, uh, they are not fighting. Where are they right at this moment? They're running. They're terrified. And they are they're running for their lives. They don't want to be caught up in this. And of all the people who could ever put up a fight, Jesus is the one who could have called um, 72,000 angels, as we learned uh, last week. But he didn't because his kingdom is not of this world. His goal was not to set up an earthly kingdom, but a spiritual kingdom which is what he's in the process of doing. Well, after this bit of back and forth, Pilate comes back to the original question in John. Uh, so, uh, you are a king? And Jesus says, you say correctly that I'm a king. For this I have been born, and for this I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. And this is where Pilate says, what is truth? And it's kind of hard to tell whether this is an honest question, what is truth? Or if it's more of just Pilate being exasperated, what is truth? Like, I have no idea what these people, you know, that kind of thing. So we don't know if it's a serious question, what is truth, or if it's just Pilate uh, being Pilate and really not knowing where to go. Um, but this is where we get back to Luke 23, 4. This is where Pilate comes back to the chief priest and the multitude saying, I find no guilt in this man. So after the initial phase, Phase one of the Roman trial, uh, this, by the way, is the first of several times that Jesus is declared innocent. So a Roman governor, an experienced man, experienced with dealing with criminals, experienced with interviewing people, he interviews Jesus, they go back and forth a bit, and Pilate finds that Jesus is not guilty of anything. This is an innocent man. He is not deserving of the death penalty. At this point, Pilate should have let him go, right? Pilate should have said, this man is innocent, um, charges dismissed, everybody get out of here, let this man get back to his life. But in Matthew and Mark, the chief priests and the elders start to accuse Je Jesus harshly. And what's interesting is Jesus does not answer. And so the chief priests are out there, they're just screaming these various accusations, some serious things, and Jesus is totally silent. But Pilate chimes in and he says to Jesus, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But even with that question, Jesus remains silent. And Pilate is amazed in both Matthew and Mark. And I'm thinking that it probably takes quite a bit to amaze a Roman governor. As I just said, this man has seen some things uh, in his life, but he sees this going on, and, and it, Jesus is not a normal criminal who would find himself before the Roman governor. Uh, he's not giving a defense, and these are some charges that could very easily be defended against. You could call up witnesses who deny these things, but Jesus does none of this. He does not answer any of these wild accusations that are being made. Back in Luke, as they accuse him of stirring up the people and teaching all over Judea from Galilee all the way down here to Jerusalem, a light bulb goes on and Pilate suddenly realizes this might not be my problem after all. This guy is from Galilee. And so Pilate is about to play a tag, you're it, and pass him off. So let's turn over then to the next paragraph, Luke 23, verses 6 through 12. Luke 23, 6 through 12. When Pilate heard it, he asked whether the man was a Galilean, and when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was in Jerusalem at that time. Now Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus, for he had wanted to see him for a long time, because he had been hearing about him and was hoping to see some sign performed by him. And he questioned him at some length, but he answered him nothing." And the chief priest and the scribes were standing there accusing him vehemently. 
And Herod, with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate. Now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day, for before they had been enemies with each other. And so again, when Pilate hears something about Galilee, he lights up, and uh, this is his chance. He suddenly uh, gets the idea that he can toss this case to somebody else. This is not my jurisdiction. Most of this guy's life has been up in Galilee. Let's send him across town to Herod. So this may not be my problem. Galilee is, is not here. It's up there with Herod. And Pilate knows that Herod just so happens to be in town for the feast, and so he sends uh, Jesus over to Herod's place. Uh, this is Herod Antipas. This is the guy I just very briefly mentioned this past Sunday when we studied the message to Pergamum. If you remember, Jesus praises Pergamum in part because they hadn't denied the Lord going back to the days when Antipas, Jesus' faithful witness, gave up his life for holding to the Lord's name. And I mentioned on Sunday that there were two men in the Bible by the name of Antipas. Antipas, the faithful witness in Revelation 2 in Pergamum, and then also Herod Antipas, the wicked ruler with the unscriptural marriage with his brother's wife, a man who ordered the execution of John the Baptist. So this is Herod Antipas. And uh, Jesus is sent to this Herod here in Luke chapter 23. And Luke is the only person to record this. This is not found in Matthew, Mark, or John. Uh, Herod, what's his attitude here when Jesus shows up at his palace? Well, he's thrilled, isn't he? He's always wanted to meet Jesus. And I don't know whether you remember this, but when Herod first hears of Jesus a few years before this, he actually thinks that Jesus might have been John come back from the dead. And there were some similarities, right? Powerful preaching and teaching, calling for repentance. Um, there were some amazing things being done and all this. And so he executes John the Baptist. And then a short time later, Jesus pops up teaching the same thing. And, and Herod apparently still has a guilty conscience over what he did to John. John is, in a sense, haunting him, not literally, but in his own mind. And he thinks this is a John come back from the dead, but it's not. It's Jesus. Of course, he's not guilty enough to do anything about it, um, not guilty enough to repent, but it's something that he perhaps worried about, maybe lost some sleep over. Uh, here we find that Herod really only wanted to see a sign, though. He wanted to see something amazing. He'd heard some things. He'd heard maybe Jesus walking on water and healing people and, and raising the dead. He wanted to see something like that, wanted to see something amazing. And here Luke tells us that Herod questions Jesus extensively. And yet notice here that Jesus answers him nothing. He does not say a word to this man. This is the man who murdered his cousin. And all through this, the chief priests are accusing him very strongly. Uh, vehemently. That's a hard word for me to say. I looked it up in the, the Greek word behind it, and it seems to me well strung. That's the like technical, the, the dictionary definition or the background of that word, well strung. And so I would kind of picture it uh, like, a, like a tightly strung instrument. Uh, these accusers, the, the Jewish leaders, they are wound up. They are ready to go. They are fired up, and they're going all out. Uh, they're on their best game here, accusing Jesus of all kinds of things. But Jesus, though, says nothing. He has no response whatsoever in front of Herod. In verse 11, Herod, seeming a little bit frustrated at the lack of response from Jesus, resorts to contempt and mocking. Uh, Herod's soldiers dress Jesus in a gorgeous robe and send him back to Governor Pilate. And, of course, for them, this is hilarious. This is funny. Here's a man who claims to be king. And so one ruler sends him back to another ruler dressed in a fine robe, just like a king would be dressed. And Luke tells us in verse 12 that Herod and Pilate, having been enemies in the past, become friends with each other over this. So Pilate apparently sees Jesus coming, uh, dressed in this fine robe, dressed like a king, and he gets it. And he sees what Herod has done there, and, and he perhaps appreciates that sense of humor, or maybe how he was tweaking the, the Jews, as Pilate loved to do. And so here's this man accused of being a king. He is now dressed as a king. So he's, he's mocking not only Jesus, but he's also mocking the accusers, isn't he? And, uh, and this brings us back to Pilate. So uh, on to phase three, I guess we might say, of the Roman trial. So phase one before Pilate, phase two before Herod, now phase three is back before Governor Pilate. So let's look at uh, Luke chapter 23, verses 13 through 25. Luke 23, verses 13 through 25. 
Pilate summoned the chief priest and the rulers and the people and said to them, You brought this man to me as one who incites the people to rebellion. And behold, having examined him before you, I have found no guilt in this man regarding the charges which you make against him. No, nor has Herod, for he sent him back to us, and behold, nothing deserving death has been done by him. Therefore I will punish him and release him. Now he was obliged to release to them at the feast one prisoner. But they cried out all together, saying, Away with this man, and release for us Barabbas. He was one who had been thrown into prison for an insurrection made in the city, and for murder. Pilate, wanting to release Jesus, addressed them again, but they kept on calling out, saying, Crucify, crucify him. And he said to them the third time, Why? What evil has this man done? I have found in him no guilt demanding death, therefore I will punish him and release him. But they were insistent with loud voices, asking that he be crucified. And their voices began to prevail, and Pilate pronounced sentence that their demand be granted. And he released the man they were asking for, who had been thrown into prison for insurrection and murder. But he delivered Jesus to their will. Matthew and Mark include a bit of background information here uh, before verse 13 in this context. So in the parallel, uh, Matthew and Mark would have some additional information on top of this. And, and they explain the governor's custom a little bit more, that his uh, tradition was to release any prisoner that the people would choose. So I don't know how many prisoners they had, but as this feast came around, that was the tradition. Uh, is there anybody you want me to let out of jail? That was their tradition, similar, I guess, to pardons that the president uh, would traditionally do in this country in his last few days of office. It's kind of a, a gesture of goodwill from the governor. Uh, to the tens of thousands who have come to Jerusalem for this feast. And so we pick up now in Luke 23, 13, with Pilate getting the chief priests and rulers and the people together, and he repeats, I think for the second time now, his ruling that Jesus has done nothing wrong. There is no guilt in him regarding the charges that you're making against him. And the same goes for Herod, Pilate says. So two rulers have now proclaimed Jesus to be innocent. And this is now Pilate's second time to proclaim him innocent. This man has done nothing deserving of death. If you think about this, Pilate is really accusing the Jews of lying, isn't he? He's saying, I don't believe you. You're not telling me the truth here that this man has done something deserving of death. I mean, at the very least, they're exaggerating, and, and Pilate's able to see through this. He's a fairly wise man. Uh, if Jesus really had claimed to be a king, as, as we think about this, um, Pilate would have him put to death immediately. It's in Pilate's, Pilate's best interest to crush any rebellion. Uh, that's his mission, to keep peace in this whole region. Uh, this is why Pilate is in this area. That's why he's in Jerusalem during the feast, to make sure uh, that Rome's rule in this area is solid and ongoing with the least amount of drama possible, no challenges to Caesar's rule. And so when the Jews come in and accuse a man of claiming to be king, and when Pilate declares the man innocent of that charge, uh, he is truly innocent, isn't he? Because again, it's in Pilate's best interest as a governor answering to Caesar uh, to squash any rebellion and to do it quickly and with ferocity. Uh, but here he just, he can't do that at this point because Jesus has done nothing wrong. Uh, as a way of perhaps meeting them halfway though, Man, Pilate's a slimy individual. <laughs> so to meet them halfway, perhaps, to satisfy their anger, notice in verse 16, he suggests punishing Jesus and then releasing him. Uh, in John, Pilate suggests releasing the king of the Jews <laughs> as this year's Passover pick. What an insult to the Jewish people. They brought him to him for claiming to be a king. How about if I release your king for you? And that's his kind of jab at the Jewish leadership. Uh, Matthew and Mark both explain that Pilate knows that the Jewish leaders are doing this because of envy. And so I think re the real unrighteousness that Pilate sees in this area now is not with Jesus, it's with the leaders. He can see that they're motivated by envy. Even a, an evil governor knows that envy is wrong. Uh, at this point, Matthew tells us that as Pilate is sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sends him an urgent message. And her message is, have nothing to do with that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. It's very strange, isn't it? So now we have 
Mrs. Pilate saying that Jesus is innocent, that she wants her husband to back away slowly, don't have anything to do with this man. Pilate, though, starts pushing their buttons at this point. He's making these people mad on purpose. And that is what happens. The Jewish mob cries out in unison, away with this man and release for us Barabbas. Matthew and Mark both explain that the Jewish leaders had stirred up the mob to ask for Barabbas and to ask that Jesus be put to death instead. Uh, notice Luke points out in verse 19 that Barabbas had been thrown into prison for an insurrection made in Jerusalem and also for murder. So murder and insurrection, those are some serious charges. There was apparently evidence he's in jail awaiting execution. And so he is an insurrectionist and a murderer. And they're accusing Jesus of insurrection, aren't they? They're accusing Jesus of being a king. They're, they're accusing him of insurrection against the empire. But they're doing it without evidence. They're not bringing up evidence. They have no evidence of this. And now they are demanding that Pilate release an actual insurrectionist who's been convicted, who's also a murderer. And then John also throws in the fact that Barabbas is a robber. So a robber, an insurrectionist, and a murderer, is the, he's the one they're calling on to release or pardon and let Jesus die in his place. In time sequence, uh, it seems that Pilate now orders Jesus to be scourged. At some point right in here, this is where the soldiers weave the crown of thorns and put it on the Lord's head. They dress him up in a purple robe. They start mocking him for being the king of the Jews. So now Pilate's soldiers are doing what Herod's soldiers had done previously. Uh, they're, they're striking him repeatedly in the face. From history, we know that some men never survived the scourging. It was incredibly violent, beating with a whip, often embedded with bits of bone or glass or stones. And I don't know whether we realize this, but also that the scourging happens in the middle of the trial. Isn't that bizarre? It, the trial is not over yet. In fact, He's been declared innocent multiple times, um, five times, I think now, by four different people. And yet, even though he is scourged, uh, the people uh, continue to demand that Jesus be crucified. So after the scourging, Pilate brings Jesus back out um, to the crowd, severely beaten, wearing this crown of thorns, purple robe, uh, and says, according to John, behold the man. In other words, look at this man. He's a bloody mess. He is not a threat. He is not a real king, is my understanding of what he's saying there. Behold the man. Look at this man. This is the man who's such a threat you need to have crucified. And Mark, he asks again, then, then what shall I do with him whom you call the king of the Jews? Notice there, I don't know if you caught that, the Jewish people aren't calling him the king of the Jews. No, they are accusing him of claiming to be the king of the Jews. But Pilate says, what do I do with the one who you claim to be the king of the Jews, which is not really what's going on here. And they respond by calling out all the more, crucify him, crucify him. And then Luke specifically has Pilate uh, asking them the third time, why, what evil has this man done? I have found no guilt in him demanding death. So I think it's at this point that he's now been declared innocent five times by the four people. And yet in spite of that, he's scourged and the people continue to... <laughs> Continue demanding crucifixion. <laughs> I don't know if you caught that. A log fell off the pile and now our dog is going berserk inside. <laughs> uh, anyway, in John, Pilate says to the Jews, take him yourselves and crucify him for I find no guilt in him. And the Jews explain that according to their law, Jesus needs to die because he makes himself out to be the son of God. And this is what finally makes Pilate a little bit nervous. He's been rather nonchalant through this whole thing, but now when he finds that one of the accusations is that this man is the son of God, uh, Pilate starts to get concerned, that along with his wife's dream. Uh, the Romans were fairly superstitious. And so Pilate brings Jesus back into the praetorium and asks him, where are you from? That's a rather strange question, isn't it? Remember, he's already established that he's from Galilee. So this doesn't seem to be a political question. This doesn't seem to be an issue of geography. Uh, this seems to be on another level entirely. Where are you from? In other words, who are you? Who are you really? And so perhaps there's some small spark there that Pilate perhaps starts to get it, at least has some clue that, that Jesus is not a normal human being here. And um, so there seems to be more to this question than we might realize. It seems he's asking maybe something of a spiritual question. 
Um, so Jesus refuses to answer. And this is where Pilate says, um, you do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? And Jesus answers, you would have no authority over me unless it had been given to you from above. For this reason, the one who delivered me up to you has the greater sin. And so Pilate has sinned in this process, in doing what he's doing. He sinned, right? He's a Gentile who is guilty of committing sin. But I think Jesus was saying there, at least you're not Judas. Judas had some advantages. Judas had some knowledge that you, Pilate, don't have. And so Judas bears the greater uh, guilt of the sin of, of bringing Jesus to the point of crucifixion. Well, now Pilate really tries to get the Jews to give up on this, but they reply, if you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. Everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. And this seems to be what finally puts Pilate over the edge. He then presents Jesus to the crowd and he brings him out there publicly on the porch or the patio or whatever. And he says, behold, your king. Boy, Pilate just seems like he really hated the Jewish people. He was really just throwing this right back at them. And the crowd continues in Luke 23, 23 with loud voices asking that he be crucified. Over in John, uh, Pilate says, shall I crucify your king? So again, he's throwing it right back at him. That is brutal. Uh, but the people reply, we have no king but Caesar, which is amazing because the Jews absolutely hated being ruled by Caesar. And yet here they are faced with Jesus or Caesar, and they would much rather have Caesar. And this is where uh, Luke tells us that their voices began to prevail. And so the mob is winning, you know, mob rule here, almost literally. A pilot at this point almost doesn't have a choice. He does have a choice, obviously, but uh, it, it's not looking good. Uh, this is also where in Matthew's account, Pilate washes his hands in front of the crowd and says, I am innocent of this man's blood. And I would point out, of course, just because we say we're innocent of something, does not mean that we are truly innocent of something. I think we understand that, but that Pilate is making it look good. I, I'm washing my hands of this. And today, don't we have that saying in our modern culture? Probably not much anymore. People don't really know the Bible like they used to. Uh, if you caught the article in Sunday's bulletin about the amen and a women uh, comment, that he, the author had some good comments about that. Uh, we may... It's very easy to make fun of something like that in current events, but we need to realize people just don't know. Um, and it's maybe no fault of their own. They have not been taught by their parents. Uh, the church in general has lost influence. People don't go to church like they used to. And so when I say washing your hands of a matter, we, at least I think most of us in this class tonight, know that that comes from the Bible. We know we could probably quote the verse. Uh, but many people in the world today no longer really know that, uh, what that, what that means. But this is where that comes from. And the people respond by saying, uh, His blood be upon us and upon our children. And uh, what, what a sad comment there. They're, they're asking, any judgment that comes, we'll, we'll take it. Whatever, if we're wrong here, then let it be. And we will, we will take the consequences. I kind of find it interesting, a few weeks later, as Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost, after the command to repent and be baptized he goes on to explain that this promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off and so they were asking for the curse or the his blood to be upon us and our children of course if anybody's willing to turn away from that sin uh, the blessing will be upon them and upon their children as well if they're willing to uh, believe and repent and obey the gospel um, here at the end Pilate gives in and he releases Barabbas and delivers Jesus over to be crucified. And thinking back over the little uh, three little paragraphs that we've studied tonight, uh, thinking back on this, I, I would just suggest as we close tonight something to think about, and that is we are Barabbas, aren't we? We are the guilty ones. We are the ones who should have died for what we did. We were legitimately guilty of things, but Jesus stepped in and he took our place willingly. He died for us on the cross. Now that seems to be a good place for us to pause tonight. 
Uh, this is a good place to take a break. So let's plan on picking up next week with Luke 23, 26, and we'll come to the Lord's crucifixion. Uh, thank you for being with us tonight, either online or on the phone. Be sure to send me any prayer requests so I can get those in the bulletin. And be sure to sign up online for worship on the Sign Up Genius account for 9 o'clock this coming Lord's Day morning. Again, we'll have the one service at 9, and if needed, we'll replay that at 1030 on the projector. And the online and the phone options uh, continue to be the same. Uh, as we close, let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as our loving Father, a Father who was willing to send your Son to this earth to live a perfect life, and yet, in spite of that, who would ultimately suffer and die for us, and we are the ones who are truly guilty. Tonight, we thank you for the book of Luke and for Luke's account of what your Son endured for us, including the injustice and the illegal trials held in the middle of the night, and then the multiple beatings and the constant insults scattered all throughout that evening and early that morning. We pray that we would never forget what he went through for us. Tonight, we pray for comfort for those who are hurting over the loss of loved ones. And we pray for those who continue to struggle with various illnesses, including those who are working their way through COVID. We ask that you would be merciful. We know that you are. We continue to pray for those in positions of authority, including our new president. We pray that you would surround Mr. Biden with wise counsel, and we pray that we as your people would be able to continue living quiet and tranquil lives in all godliness and dignity. We come to you in the name of Jesus, your Son, our Lord and our Savior, the King of Kings. Amen.